Uh, hello and welcome to Bread Theory and welcome in Raiders. Thank you so much, Bread Crochets, for the, the very generous raid. Um, if you are new to this channel, uh, please don't hesitate to give me a follow. Uh, I'm, I'm Bread Theory. I, I am Zach. Um, I usually do uh, theory streams. I do those every Friday night. And we had just finished up The Conquest of Bread um, by Peter Kropotkin this last Friday. And this Friday, we're going to move on to uh, the principles of communism. I alternate back and forth between uh, communist and anarchist theory. But on, on Sunday nights, we do things a little different. Uh, so I do kind of whatever. <laughs> Thank you very much, bread support bread. So on Sunday nights, I do kind of whatever I f I'm feeling like at the moment. And lately, that's been giving you guys a, a solid introduction to the world of permaculture. I think it's a very important uh, philosophy, uh, way of looking at the world, uh, design framework, and I am, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I was, I was, uh, I was just about to, to start anyway. Um, I was just finishing up, uh, getting, you know, my, my drink and everything. And, uh, but that, that's great that you're rated. I'm, I'm so, I'm so pleased to, to have more people to, to chat with and, and to share this wonderful information with. Um, so anyway, permaculture, for those that are, are unaware, is a design system that's most often applied to agriculture, but you can apply it to any sort of thing that you want to design. It, it consists primarily of three ethics, those being the um, uh, care for the earth, care for people, and return the surplus to the, um, to the service of the, the first two ethics, uh, also known as fair share often. And then there are other commonly 12 principles that one of the co-founders, David Holmgren, laid out. Um, and I'm going to pull that up. Oh, thank you so much for the, the, the follow, MetaGG. I hope very much that you uh, enjoy the, the sort of things I have to share tonight. And I hope to see you in, in uh, future streams as well. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the principles of commu uh, communism, the principles of permaculture, which uh, could be applied to communism as well. Um, so... These are the, the basic design principles. Let me make sure that's that's showing up well on your screen. Yes, it is. Okay. So we have things like observe and interact, catch and store energy, obtain a yield, apply self-regulation and accept feedback, use and value renewable resources and services, produce no waste, design from patterns to details, integrate rather than segregate, use small and slow solutions, uh, use and value diversity, use edges and value the marginal, and finally, the 12 o'clock position, creatively use and respond to change. So it's a lot to remember. I myself, having um, been doing permaculture for a number of years, I got my certificate, my permaculture design certificate in 2016, um, and was, you know, applying the principles far before that. But even I have trouble keeping all 12 of those in my head at the same time. It's, it's a big task. Um, so it's helpful to have resources like this. You can just go to permacultureprinciples.com and then slash principles, and it'll bring those up for you if you ever forget one. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's get into what we're going to talk about tonight, which is more introduction to permaculture. Ah, just call you Giga. <laughs> I will, uh, Giga. Um, let's see. Let me just scroll through chat. I have, I have so many more chatters than I, than I am accustomed to. So just give me a second here to, to catch up. I uh, believe that the world is a simulation. That's why we should abolish money. Hey, I mean, that's, that's as good a reason as any to abolish money and, and move to a, a needs-based economy where uh, everyone is, is uplifted to reach their highest and best potentials. I, I can get on board with that. <laughs> Um, let's see. <laughs> All right. You know, simulation or not, I think we should, we should make the best of the situation we find ourselves in. Want the, you want the Star Trek future? The Star Trek future is pretty great too, you know, and, and fits pretty well with, with permaculture. Uh, talking about abundance rather than scarcity, getting beyond, um, ideas of 
Yeah. What do you replace money with? Uh, basically, the, the as we were talking about in the conquest of bread, one way you could do it is you just say, okay, uh, you have a revolution, um, whether that's a, a, a physical revolution or basically just enough people agree and, and build enough parallel systems to the, the current governments that they are no longer relevant. Um, however you get to it, you have a revolution. And basically you say, okay, workers now are also the owners of the means of production. If you work in a factory, you now own an equal share in that factory as every other worker. Um, so we're getting rid of, of people uh, just living off the, the work of others. So that's, that's, a, that's a big part of it. And then we're just continuing production as normal. But instead of, um, instead of having money come into the system, we look at instead needs. So we, we decide, now that we don't have to pay an owner, that's a big chunk of it, um, because if you think about it, most of, or, or perhaps even just a large chunk of what you produce every day, no matter what it is you do as a worker, goes straight to whatever your boss, not your boss, but your, the owner of your company wants to do with it. They decide where the excess goes. If we're doing away with that, already we have to work less to produce the same amount of stuff, right? Um, to have the same output. So... Uh, the idea then is to say how much, we'll, we'll just take bread for a, a good example. How much bread does the average person need to consume in a year? Then we look at the, the amount of production um, that is required throughout all the, the different steps in the process to, to turn wheat into bread. Um, how much labor needs to go into all of that stuff? And we decide, okay, that's how much we need to do for this particular region. You know, taking into consideration things like, you know, if there's potentially a famine or um, if you underestimate these sorts of things. Now you have the needs um, calculated out. So X amount of labor needs to go into producing the bread for everyone. So you, you, you go back then to all the, the people that are in that supply chain and you say this is much how much we need to work in order to achieve uh, the needs that, that we have right now and then you just do it and then wherever there's a need you then link it up with someone who is producing something to fill that need um, it, it doesn't have to be a barter system it can be more of a, a, a system of, of just mutual aid I have excess of this I'm going to give it to you because you need it basically um, and yeah and, and Kropotkin's idea was that these, these things would be very self-organizing especially with people taking more control of the means of production and their destinies, um, having more choices in their life to decide what they want to do. Uh, and that, you know, just, it would kind of, co it would, it would, uh, the, the needs and, and the outputs would just kind of coalesce with one another. And you'd have groups that would, that would start up saying, you know, taking inventory of the, the amount of housing there is in uh, a given city and saying we have this many units of housing and this many people that need housing, and and then just start distributing it, just based on who says that they need it, you know, and you would do that for every single thing. Um, so that's one way of doing it. It's not the only way of doing it. Uh, just, <laughs> just one way. Okay, so if we live in post scarcity, the concept of value is absolutely absolutely, and permaculture is is a really good tool that we can use because unlike basically any other sort of agricultural system. It's even kind of, most people would even place it outside of agriculture because the goal is not just to, you know, turn the land into a living factory of, of food production for yourself and making the most profit. The idea is to be uh, a co-creator in your own ecosystem. So we're all dependent on ecosystems for not just food, but for, you know, all the materials that we use to build our houses, um, for uh, the things we need to, to have, you know, any sort of means of production. It all, it all is dependent on one, you know, to one degree or another on the local ecosystems. So even though it might be hard to think of yourself as part of an ecosystem, you still are. Uh, and you're still very much dependent on it. If the ecosystems all collapse tomorrow, we would, we would be doomed. 
you know, there's, there's, there's no amount of money you can just throw at, at ecosystem collapse that's, that's just going to turn it around on its own. Um, oh, Brett Crochet says that, that uh, their ice plant bloomed today and it is a succulent like the, the chicks and hens. I, lo I love succulents. My, my wife and I have really gotten into uh, plant collection during the pandemic and a little bit before that, but, but it's really come up a lot since the, the pandemic had started. And so, yeah, we have quite a few succulents at this point. Uh, she just bought another couple of, of cacti as well today. She's now moved into the, the cactus collection portion of, of plant stuff. So you can, you can see a, a little bit of, of our plant collection behind me. Um, had you seen past weeks, uh, you would have seen my living room as well, which is just draped in, in green stuff. Like the entire, we have a really nice south facing window and the entire thing almost is filled with, with stuff, you know, stuff on shelves, stuff hanging from, uh, from bars, stuff climbing literally up the wall. Uh, we got a lot of stuff in, in terms of growing in our very small apartment. And that, and that's part of what I like to talk about with permaculture is that it doesn't take a, l a large portion of land to do it. Any amount of land that you have, even if it's just your living room, if you all you need is is a window that you can devote, and you can do you can grow something, even if it's uh, uh, you know facing away from the sun. Say if you're in the the northern hemisphere and you have a north facing window, you can still grow something, um, potentially something even that you could find useful other than just for beauty and and you know a certain degree of companionship with with other living things <laughs> uh so yeah so uh permaculture getting back into that it it it, it tries to think of ourselves as co-creators in building abundance and and a healthy functioning ecosystem that we can also get a lot of products from and those products are usually breaking down, broken down into food, fodder, which is, which is food for animals, fuel, which could be, you know, if you have a wood, wood burn, uh, excuse me, a wood burning stove, um, or, or whatever other sort of fuel that you can, you can find to grow, um, fiber, which is, is building materials, and then pharmacy, which is, is, is medicines that we can grow as well. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter what size you, of, of land you have, you can do something. And also if, if you get together with your local community, you can pool your resources and perhaps take over a, a larger chunk of land that you can all benefit from, start a community garden, something like that. Employ the principles more, um, extensively on a space. So yeah, so that's all possible with permaculture. So, uh, a little bit of a recap on, on where we've been so far. We have talked about such topics as the, the ethics and principles, which I've told you about just, just now again. We've gotten into who the founders were, Bill Mullison, who was a professor in a University of Tasmania in Australia and his uh, graduate assistant, David Holmgren. Those are the two co-originators of the permaculture concept. We've gotten into a little bit of their lives, and um, we've moved into the ethics, uh, some more in-depth talk of the ethics of permaculture. We've tried to define what permaculture is not, and then we've started looking at this, this wonderful series of videos by Oregon State University, um, that, that they use when they teach their permaculture design certificate course. And to, to like the, the, the basic level you need in order to say that you practice permaculture is a permaculture design certificate. And it requires, um, on the specific coursework you have to go through, it has to be a 72 hour course at minimum. And it has, you know, a few different components that you gotta cover. Usually it's taught in tandem with, uh, the, the book Permaculture Designer's Manual, which you can find online for free. There's a free PDF of it. All you have to do is just search for a free PDF of Permaculture Designer's Manual. This is the, the most important text put out by Bill Mollison. And it's, it's the largest chunk of, of his ideas um, concerning permaculture. 
we'll go into the full text here. Um, anyway, it goes into, it's so nice that my neighbor decided right now to start revving their engine. That's fun. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, 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 the text goes into a bunch of different things. Uh, let's look just at the table of contents here. Uh, anyway, it goes into uh, a whole bunch of stuff that you need to know to be a permaculture designer. Um, so you take the course, you usually read that book or another book that's, that's similar to it. You do a design project. There's supposedly supposed to be a talent show at the end of everything. I don't think everyone adheres to that as, as a necessary part of the education, but it's supposed to be there. And then you can use the, the, the title of, of permaculture and whatever you do with your business. Um, so yeah, so that, that's the basics of, of going through the course. Let's get back to the, the video list. So basically these videos I've been going through are um, a lecturer who is, is uh, at the same time illustrating um, these different concepts. And uh, we've gone through a bunch of them so far. We've talked about uh, foundations of permaculture design, uh, climate and topography, permaculture shelter design, um, uh, permaculture site analysis, building community, permaculture decision ma making matrix. These are all things you can go back and look at my previous streams. And also pretty soon I'll have them up on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'll drop that link again where you can find all of my different uh, places that I put out. The, the archives of this, this uh, stream, as well as the podcast. I do it in, in both YouTube form and on, as a podcast. We've talked about, um, let's see, identifying microclimates, the solar aspect, and uh, designing by sectors and zones. And now we're into uh, doing permaculture design for slope. So, because we're a little ways into this, this is now the, the fourth edition of this, I, I expect there will be a few questions, and, and don't hesitate to, to ask if things are flying over your head or you're not really sure how it relates to permaculture in any way, um, especially if you're brand new to permaculture. Please ask lots of questions. I really, it really helps me understand where other people are coming from, and it, you know, it helps me share the knowledge that, that I'm trying to share here. So let's get into this, this first video of the night, Permaculture Design for slope and then the, the professor's name is Andrew Millison he's, he's a pretty well-known permaculture designer done work all over the United States he's, he's really good at what he does the next layer in the design process that we will look at is design for slope we've already looked at the permaculture zones and sectors and both of those design tools use somewhat of a regular pattern. The zones being a concentric circle pattern and the sectors expressed as pie wedges on the sector compass. But the fact is that hardly any sites are actually so regular that these geometric templates fit neatly over them. The truth is that the that's true and, and that's a big point of, of the permaculture concept is it's it's ideally not so supposed to be like a one size fits all, but it's supposed to change and adapt based on the the conditions on the ground, you know. Just because you might want to store water uh, above the level of your house doesn't mean there's a good spot on the land for you to do that. Um, just because you may want to do aquaculture doesn't mean you're going to have enough rainfall to sustain it. These sorts of things. So you have to be able to change and adapt. That's one of the, the main principles, if you recall, we just went through. So these, these, these concepts are good, but they, they really have to be shaped and molded to the conditions you find yourself in. You may find yourself in an apartment like myself, and you don't have <laughs> different zones. The zones, very briefly, are the zones of activity. So you take the place where you live and then, you know, have your time off of work, your home, and you make that zone zero. That's where you spend most of your time. And then the, the concentric ring around that point is areas that you can visit a lot. That would be zone one. And you have things like maybe herbs or um, 
maybe vegetables that just need more tending to so that it's you're reducing the amount of work to to take care of them you're not having to go way out a mile in each direction to take care of something that that needs to be watered every single day for example um, the next zone out of that a little bit less work is needed the next zone out of that even less you may visit that part only once in a while you may have that be your pasture land where you, you only are visiting it you know, maybe maybe you have a, a once a week rotation for your your particular animals and you, you move them from pen to pen once a week. So you basically only visit it once a week. And then there's uh, zone five, which that gets out into the wilderness, the, the areas that you leave basically undisturbed. And the idea being that you're creating a reserve for nature, um, but also a buffer to, to help keep things from coming onto your property that you don't necessarily want. That could be pesticide drift. You're not locating your crops too close to your property line where, you know, you have an unexpected gust of wind as they're crop dusting the neighbor's property and all of that, that pesticide uh, drifts into your field or herbicide or whatever it is they, they happen to be spraying. You may not necessarily want that. So that creates a buffer as well. It also creates, you know, space for, for wild animals to just be. You know, it's that's part of taking care of the earth as well. Um, so just just briefly, that's that's kind of what the, the zones mean. And then sector is the different flows of energy. It's where does the sun come from? Which way do the winds come in different seasons? What's the topography? Where does the water flow? All these sorts of things are the sector analysis of what you're doing. So that's what he's talking about right now. The topography of the earth is infinitely varied and each site has unique variations of climate, microclimate, soil, aspect, slope, water flow, hydrology, wind direction, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. Each site is unique. So the permaculture design process continues on beyond zones and sectors. And the next design layer that we're going to look at is slope. On a compass that is 360 degrees all the way around, one quarter of that is 90 degrees. A slope that bisects that is 45 degrees. Math that 45 degree slope represents... Math is not my strong suit, so if, if any of this is just too many numbers coming at you, let me know, I'll try to, to help break it down. That's an equal rise so I know how it feels. and an equal run. So, if a completely flat slope is 0% and a straight up and down slope is 100%, then half of that is a 50% slope, which is the same thing as a 45 degree slope. Now the third way to express this same slope is as a ratio H to V or horizontal to vertical. So this slope has an equal horizontal to vertical measure. So it is a one-to-one -one slope. Now, all those different ways are used to express slopes. It really varies by country, by discipline, and by the situation. But for this lecture and throughout the course, I will primarily use percentages, right? I personally find the easiest way to conceptualize a slope is in percentages, and I'm gonna draw and I've drawn this grid here to do my drawing on top of so that we can better conceptualize the slope for this module. Now, we're going to start by looking at how people practice different land uses on different gradients of slope. This is a 75% slope and is about the maximum slope that we see in the world that anyone has cultivated for agriculture. In some areas of China, Vietnam, the Philippines, we find terraced rice paddies built on these slopes at a great expense of effort, as well as tea plantations when we look around. So terraces on this kind of slope um, also exist in Peru, in the Andes Mountains, and probably a Hi. really tall terrace wall to get a small growing area. This is an incredible amount of work for not a great deal of space, as you can see. 
So only civilizations who have really limited arable lands with great population pressure and a surplus of labor and resources would undertake such a project. It's actually pretty mind-blowing to think of the civil engineering involved in these hand-built projects because there's a huge risk of... I just want to take one moment to, to show you exactly the, the sort of rice paddies that he's talking about. If you've never seen this before, it's pretty remarkable what these people have achieved without any sort of what we would consider industrialized equipment. Um, They're some of the most productive pieces of agriculture on the planet, just as they are. Let's look at some pictures of that. Like, just look at this. So let's bring that up. That's just incredible. And these are, these are very ancient uh, patties as well. So a lot of this would have been hand dug or dug with the assistance of a plow and maybe an oxen. And that's how m most of these are, are cultivated to this day. It's just with simple animal husbandry. And one of the reasons they're, they're so productive is because they, they, um, they integrate a lot of the permaculture principles before that was ever even a thing. They produce no waste for one thing. You have the oxen that, that act as your muscle to, to cultivate the land. They poop into the water, and that acts as fertilizer for the rice paddy. Um, you also have a lot of edge space. This, this is definitely marginal land otherwise. This would be very difficult to, to grow anything on if, if you didn't really have to. But they have, they have valued the marginal, and they have maximized the edge effect. So you have a lot of edges where drier soil meets wetter soil, and, and literally flooded soil at, at certain times of the year. Um, so, so they really embody pretty much all the permaculture principles without ever having, you know, specifically learned the discipline. So, so in a lot of ways, permaculture is trying to play catch up with, with a lot of things that traditional peoples have known for a long time. But what it's trying to do is more systematize it into something that we can use and, and scale to whatever, and, and also adapt to whatever system that, that we need it for today. But I mean, just these, these are gorgeous and incredibly productive. You get a whole lot of, especially for a grain crop as well, which is one of the hardest things to produce um, because you just have to use, you have to devote so many acres of it just to, to make enough of it to be profitable um, and to sustain even yourself. That It's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. But let's get back to the video. Continue on of destabilizing the slope with work like this. Now, it's a lot more common to find uh, patties and terraces. Oh, I see. You say it should be audio filters in OBS. Okay, cool. I will, I will check it out. At more like a 50% slope. That's still considered very... Yeah, and you know, I've, I've been doing streaming for just a few months now. I think I started right after the new year maybe end of January, kind of early February. So I'm still learning a lot. So I, I do appreciate that, that help. Thanks a lot for the comments. Very steep, but I'll show you what that looks like. And you can see here, the ratio of wall height to terrace width gets better as the slope becomes more gentle. Now you wouldn't have a terrace wall. It was completely vertical anyway. You'd have it on a slight slope, but I'm just drawing the geometry of it. Uh, not a uh, actual construction document here. So people are cultivating extreme slopes all over the world, but that doesn't mean it's ideal when we look at the whole watershed system and what the optimum uses of different slope gradients are. Now, it could be ideal though, especially in, in lands that don't get a lot of rainfall, if you had some sort of a terrace system where you know, he's, he's drawing it just as, as a straight across terrace, really with those, those rice paddies that I showed you. It's more like a scoop. So the water forms that, that, that um, flat level, but it, it's more of a scoop out. So all the water that falls on that land, instead of running off, it just gets retained there. Um, and depending on your soil, it, it may sink down and then, you know, slowly over time kind of uh, filter back out 
further down the slope, right? So we're, we're catching, we're storing the energy, and we're slowly releasing it. And that kind of mitigates those, those dry and, and wet spells. So that, that could be an optimal situation um, or design situation for whatever it is that you are trying to do. There's a lot of permaculturists that like to use what's known as a, a ditch or, or a swale and berm system. So you have a swale, which is just a long trench for drainage um, that, that is used to collect the water. Oftentimes it's on the contour of the land, meaning like if you were to say, look at uh, a topographical map. Let's, let's pull up a topographical map. So something like that. Um, where you have the lines, and each of those lines represents a particular elevation, right? No, I don't need a free day trial. No, thank you. Um, so each of these lines represents a different elevation, and it, you know, depending on on the the um, construction of the map, there may be a ten foot difference in elevation between the lines, but but it's the same interval from line to line. So, so if the lines are spread out, you know that's a flatter area. If the lines are closer together, you know that's, that's more steep. But what you can do is then put a ditch all the way around each of those rings, right? So you might start right in the middle, put a ditch all the way around there, and then you put a ditch at the next 10 foot interval all the way around. So the ditch itself stays at the same elevation, the same absolute elevation, right? And then next to that ditch, you would put a berm, which is just the opposite. So instead of a ditch that goes all the way around, you have a mound that goes all the way around next to the ditch. So that, that, that kind of basically doubles the amount of water catching capacity you have. And so then anytime water falls on the land, it gets caught in that ditch. It gets channeled to that area. And then ideally you want to have it, especially if you're in a, a mosquito filled in sort of climate, you want to have that drain within 24 hours because otherwise mosquito larvae can will be attracted to the still water they'll breed and and you'll have problems but if it drains within less than in in 24 hours or less you're fine because the larvae doesn't have enough time to mature and in fact mosquitoes will lay their larvae in that that water thinking it's a good place and then it will dry out uh, too quickly for them and they'll all die and you have less mosquitoes so a win-win but anyway, as that water then filters in, as I was talking about before, it slowly seeps through the soil, um, and then it will come, you know, as it, it, it tends to follow, um, I don't know what the degree is usually, but it, it kind of goes with the, the curvature of the topography. So, so it'll go down the slope, um, and it will start coming out little by little, further and further down the slope. And... You know, the, the, so then the roots of the plants that you have down there, even though it hasn't maybe rained in a while, still have access to a certain amount of moisture. And you can get to the point, if you have enough of these in a, in a system, where you can start making springs coming out at, at very far down the, the elevation uh, points in the landscape. Um, you can have that much of an abundance of water. Um, and then also, another benefit of doing that sort of thing is you're creating microclimates. So... The, the, the berms themselves can shade behind them, potentially, depends on which way they're facing. Uh, but you may have spaces that are shadier throughout the day or have exposure uh, on, in the morning or in the evening, and that can change the microclimate. And that's maximizing that edge effect again. So you can have a lot more things you can grow. You can grow things that need a lot of drainage at the top of your berms and things that need a lot of extra water in, in the ditches, in your swales, right? So you can have a lot of stuff growing all together. And if you do it really well, if you design it really well, there'll be plants that, that benefit each other in one way or another. They may be um, one plant attracts a certain predatory insect that helps keep the, the, the bad insect population down. It may be that it's a plant like... Uh, like a pea or, or, or a bean that, that fixes nitrogen, that takes his nitrogen out of the air and makes it into available fertilizer for other plants. So you can have all these, these synergies happening just within these, these small microclimates, these small microbiomes, really. Um, so that, yeah, that's just one technique. You don't have to do that sort of thing. In fact, there'll be times when that's not appropriate. Um, maybe you get too much water and you risk 
having constant overflows, right? And you, your berms are just falling apart at that point. Might not be the best place to put it. All right, let's get back to the video. In the Permaculture Designer's Manual, Bill Mollison advocated that any slope steeper than 20% be kept in permanent forest for permanent soil stability and for a number of other reasons. Now, <clears throat> I've drawn a 25% slope for ease. You can see it's one to two. You can see how the 75% slope for the same rise of terrace, you get one unit of uh, horizontal space. On the 50% slope for the same rise of terrace, you get two units of space. And then on the 25% slope for the same rise of terrace, you get four units of horizontal space. Okay, so permanent forest does not mean it's an unproductive landscape by any means. And I'd be really curious about what Bill Mollison's prescription would be in a land scarce and people rich area where extreme slopes are currently being cultivated. Now we're gonna look at a typical foothills landscape profile in the temperate or humid environment with. Well, welcome, uh, Stern Samu, oh boy. You really like a lot of oohs and oohs. Uh, Samus Nuni. That's, that's my best guess for right now. Uh, Strin Samus Nuni. Samus Nuni? Hey. Well, welcome to the, the, the stream. We are covering permaculture. This is my, my fourth in the, in the series of introducing uh, uh, viewers to the concept of, of permaculture. And we're going through some of the design elements right now. So if you like what you see, please, um, Stern. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, well, welcome anyway. And if you like what you see, I hope you give me a follow. You know what? I, I, I meant to mention it earlier, but I, I got so so flustered having to start the show with uh, that raid, that, that very nice raid that came in, that I, I forgot to, or Sam, okay. I, I forgot to mention that I am very close, very, very close to making affiliate. Um, I have the right number of hours per, uh, per month, the right number of, of streams per month. And I, I'm getting real close to the number of average viewers per stream. I, and I've had enough people chatting at the same time, all, all the different metrics, except one, I have an average of like 1.1 1 .1 something viewers per, per stream. And I need to have an average of three. So I'm, I'm pretty close. So if you know anyone that likes um, talk about permaculture, talked about, or talk about leftist theories of various types, or talk about new urbanism. Those are the three main categories that I like to cover. Also, sometimes I just, I just dunk on right-wing chuds because it's fun and it, it makes for good content. So if you like any of those sorts of things and you know someone else who does, please let them know. Please share this, this, um, this stream with them, uh, uh, this channel, or, or, or my YouTube content or anything. But I, I'm really hoping I can get to affiliate sometime soon. So just a little side note for you. Thanks for watching. Rounded hills and relatively gentle slopes. So at the top of the hill here, we have a gentle slope that is a 10% slope right here. Then as we go down from the top of the hill, we have a steeper 30% gradient. This then breaks right here into a gentle. Thank you so much for the kind words, uh, Sam. I guess I'll just I'll go with Sam. I, I, I hope you do find this to be based content. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm maybe a bit too old to, to use that kind of slang anymore. But, um, you know, if it, if it works for you, definitely, definitely appreciate the compliment. Thank you. 15% gradient, uh, which then uh, hits basically the slope uh, at the bottom of the valley, which flattens out to 5%. Okay, so I'll add some irregularity now to make it a little bit more realistic. So at 30%, Mollison says we want to keep this in permanent forest. And, and just remember that because it's permanent forest doesn't mean we can't use it as well. We just have to be very mindful 
of our impact as, as we're planting and harvesting and, and, you know, shaping it in one way or another. Because once you get to that, that 30% slope, there's, there's a, a much higher chance of, of erosion happening. And that's the last thing you want if you have a regenerative goal in mind. You want the opposite of erosion. You want so to start building little by little. And it can take a long time. Uh, just naturally, um, one, of the, one of the, you know, just a, a side note here, one of the, the, the deepest, if you will, soil columns of, of soil that's been produced by, by living things, right, by the plants themselves, is on the Great Plains in places like Iowa, where it can be, uh, you can have as much as, as 12 feet down of topsoil. And that is incredible because the average is like something like two to five inches, wherever else you go in the world of, of topsoil. And this is soil that's, that's created through biological activity. To create that, that 12 feet took thousands of years, thousands, millions of generations of, of prairie plants that have roots that reach way down into that soil, 12, 15 feet or more. Um, and there's quite a few plants that do that on, on the, the Great Plains and the tall grass prairie. But it takes a long time to build that up naturally. We can, we can boost that process through, through faster methods of composting. We can, we can get that regeneration rate going faster. But still, it's a delicate thing and you want to treat it preciously, you know, as, as the precious commodity that it is. So that's why he's talking about having permanently planted um, any slope that's greater than, than 30 degrees. Or 30 per, 30 percent excuse me what was it 30 degrees this Either has way. several benefits first off this is the upper watershed so the flow of water is well thank you so much for stopping by bread crochets i really do again appreciate the the raid very much um you have a good night as well and good luck with your stream i i hope it goes really well um any of you who may be watching who are not familiar with bread crochet's stream very great leftist content. Um, he makes uh, really cool cre crochet creations. I don't even know what you call them. It's not, it's not just like blankets and stuff like that, but it, uh, you know, it'll be like, I, I don't even know what a good example of that is, but it's, it's like you know, pop culture sort of things. And at the same time, he'll listen to um, leftist audiobooks or, or the, the text-to-speech version of a leftist book. So it's, it's cool. It's, it's very similar to the, the kind of content that I do. So if you haven't checked them out yet, please go give them a follow and a subscription. They, they're, they're doing great work. So go ahead and do that. Slowed and absorbed to slowly percolate down slope and build the subsurface water table. Now, the water table gets deeper as you go up the hill. So this is what I was kind of trying to describe earlier. The water table on a slope tends to follow the slope pretty well. And as, as you see, as, as, as things start to level out, it gets closer and closer to the surface to the point where it could burst out as a spring once it gets low enough. Yarn babies, that's a good word for them. All right. Well, I, I, I am always impressed by the, the, the stuff that you come up with. So that's really cool. And more shallow, closer to the surface down the valley. As we have fog and humidity move through the low atmosphere, these forested hills and ridges will actually serve as moisture collectors when water condenses on all the surface area, their leaves and needles. This serves to add more moisture into the upper watershed, which finds its way down through the system. So this is one way that, that adding forests can literally change the local climate. You know, with all the surface area that, that even something like a, a pine tree has, um, they can collect some of that, that morning mist or, or, or dew, and, and, and if it, enough of it builds up on the, on the leaves and stuff, it'll start going down into the soil and it can start raising that water table up and, and nourishing that water table again. Whereas if it was just bare dirt, you know, some of it may, may uh, just build up on the, on the surface of the soil, but not, mon not much of the, the fog or, or early morning mist is going to really do that. And then in all likelihood, once the sun comes out, it would all just evaporate away and you get no gain. But this just by adding trees, you're starting to change your local microclimate. 
and enough the forest trees. Is... enough trees you will actually you can actually alter the the patterns of rain because of evapotranspiration i'll get to that in a second um so yeah so thank you for the follow uh do the opposite of cnn okay i'm trying to do the opposite of cnn i'm trying to give you stuff that's actually useful to your life that's not bought and paid for by uh you know moneyed interest the, the different commercial interests that that doesn't uh, you know i'm definitely not doing this for commercial reasons because i'm not getting paid for it so thank you very much for the follow and hello to ali osher uh another great leftist streamer that you all should go check out go give ali osher a follow does a lot of good coverage of um, political news, especially stuff that comes out of the White House from a leftist perspective. And uh, good day to you as well. Allie, uh, happy to have you here. We are learning about some, some permaculture design concepts. So we're, we're, we're talking about how to analyze the slope that you may have if you have a large piece of property and how to um, treat different parts of it based on, on just how how... Uh, severe that that grade or that slope is and and how that is going to affect things like the water table and um, if you get enough trees you can start affecting the water cycle even more because you have uh, evapotranspiration where the, the trees pull water out of the ground um, and then it comes up through their their leaf tips and evaporates out into the world it's, it's kind of like how we respirate a little bit of water as we breathe out very similar sort of thing and enough trees can alter entire weather patterns so you can you can that's the i mean that's literally the only reason that you have rain as far into the continent as say like my state of minnesota is because you have enough of that conveyor belt just little by little it rains the trees bring it back up from the the ground it evapotranspirates out into the air forms more clouds further down or further inland, rains again, and the cycle can re repeats itself. We would not have the Mississippi River if it were not for forests bringing moisture deeper and deeper into the continent. Oh, and also grass as well, but but primarily forests are, are the big driver of weather patterns. Slope also has the effect of breaking up the cold air that flows down the hill at night. But cold air does flow down, and at the very bottom of the slope, at the bottom of the valley, there will be a frost line where the frost will settle in winter in a temperate climate where you have freezes. And that's an important design consideration because uh, just one small example, if you have things like um, apple trees and, and most of the fruit bearing trees that you're familiar with, the cherries, pears, plums, peaches, they're all from the same family of trees. They like to send out their their flowers in the springtime and if you put them in an area where you get frost pockets every day they might be putting trying to put out their flowers as it, it keeps frosting morning after morning and if, if they get enough frost that may kill all of their their flowers they get no pollinators then you have no fruit for that season so you don't probably want to put your fruit trees below that frost line if they're they're um, sending out their flowers before there's there's any danger of frost. So in Minnesota, typically May fifteenth is seen as the, the 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 first day where you can be reasonably guaranteed you're not going to have any sort of frost in the morning. So if they're if they're flowering after that point, you don't really got to worry about that. But if you have some early bloomers, which you may want depending on you know how you want to have your your harvest cycle. Um, we've talked about this in, in previous streams, but if you have a large plot of land that would be more than you could manage by yourself or, or with your family or a group of people that you have with you, if it was all one crop, like imagine it was all corn, if it'd be more corn than you could, you could manage just by hand on your own, a way that you can kind of get around that is by having a bunch of different crops where... Uh, you may be seeding them if you're seeding them more than once. If they're an annual crop, you may be seeding them at one time, but then uh, for the next week, you're harvesting something else. And then the next week, you may be seeding something different and harvest something else. So you always have only as much work on the farm to do 
as you can handle. And for each crop, you have a season where you need to do something to it, right? You need to either plant it, or if it's a perennial, you may just need to come by and, and harvest, or you maybe need to trim the trees once in a while. So you base your work um, on the idea that you're never going to have more uh, work to do than your family or your unit of, of workers can handle at any given time. And that way you can manage a much bigger area than you could if it was all just one crop where you had to plant all at the same time and it just took more labor than you could produce on your own farm and you had to bring in outside labor. And then there's not much to do. Maybe you, you water and you can man manage that on your own. But then at the end of the season, you have to harvest all at once because it all comes into its harvest season at the same time. And again, you have to pull in outside labor. So we're trying to catch and store labor energy. So instead of having all the labor happening at once by picking different crops that, that, that bloom at different times, that, that fruit at different times and need to be harvested at different times, we can spread that work out over the course of the entire growing season and even beyond. There, there are certain crops that, that can happen outside of the growing season, even in a place like Minnesota. The, for a late season example of that, there's the American persimmons. Uh, a rare fruit, you might see it in like a Whole Foods or, or, or I think maybe once in a while I've seen it in a, a larger chain, a more conventional chain. Um, but it's a fruit that you have to wait actually until it, har it, it uh, frosts over for a week or two or something like that before it actually fully ripens. So you're harvesting after the rest of the crops have all been put to bed and, and you know, you've, you've taken in the harvest for that. On the other end of, of the, the growing season, if you do sugar maples, that tends to happen in, I think, February is the time in the, in the Midwest. So as soon as you get um, morning thaws, that's the good time to start tapping for, for maple trees. So that's before you've even planted a single thing. So you could conceivably have work for a, a large portion of the year. We're talking maybe nine months out of the year, even if a few of those months are still, you know, cold, and you may even get snow in some of those months as well. Um, but that's just one more way you can spread that work out over the, the calendar year a little bit more. And then if you have animals, of course, you can be um, harvesting things like eggs, you know, year-round. Even if the production goes down, you still can have something to do in the middle of winter. Another thing to note at this time is that soils are shallow on the slopes and get deeper as we descend down into the valley. This is because soils weather over time and drift down to deposit at the bottom of the system. You can see how this point right here where the slope breaks is where soils start to deepen. This inflection point where the, stope, where the slope goes from steeper to more gentle, right here, okay? This is called the key point, which is a term that's coined by P.A. Yeomans, the Australian inventor of the key line design system. So just very briefly, uh, key line design came about before permaculture. It was, it was one of the predecessors to permaculture design. His main concept was the idea of taking all that fertility that tends to build up in a soil, in a, in a valley, because of this, this erosion, the nutrients just naturally filter down, and try to keep it as high as possible by, by using a special kind of plow. It's called a subsoiler. I'm not incredibly familiar with its workings, but basically you plow all at that same elevation, or you have a very gentle slope if you're trying to bring nutrients from one place to another. And the idea is to, to help keep the nutrients higher in the valley so you spread out the the fertility a little bit more and that's a, another similar uh, that, that's a very similar technique to what i was just talking about earlier with the the swale and berm technique so instead of that soil eroding now with that ditch that swale you have a space for it to collect where the nutrients aren't going to come down the valley uh, quite as fast. You can keep that fertility higher and higher. Um, 
So yeah, just another way of, of catching and storing another form of energy, which is fertilizer. Now, when we look back at our earlier drawings of the terraces on steep slopes, right? How, and how as the slope becomes more gentle, the terrace width becomes greater with the same height of the terrace wall, right? We have one unit on the 75%, we have two units width on the uh, 50 percent, and then we actually have four units width when we get to a slope of 25 percent, right? The same theory is true for when you're building dams and storages of water. The key point right here is where the slope, and where the slope breaks is a really efficient place to store water in the landscape because of the uh, sudden gentleness of the slope. This keeps all of the water at a greater height above all of these areas down below, which means that water stored up at this elevation can be distributed by gravity. So this area here in the mid-slope, below the forest and above the frost line, right? This is, this is considered the very best area for horticulture and hence the best area for housing and zone one activities. Remember, zone one is that area immediately around your house where you grow your, your um, vegetables and, and fruit and animals as well that need the most attendance day after day, the, the first thing you do in the morning. Um, I think Bill Mullison described it once as, like, it's the area where if you went out in your socks in the morning, by the time you collected your food and got back, they wouldn't be sopping wet, right? So very close to the house. That's that zone one area. Now, as we move down into the flat valley bottom where we have a 5% slope, which could feel quite flat if you're actually there, then let's consider now the efficiency of water storage at this point on the slope. You can see here how the same size embankment holds back so much more water on a gentle slope. This place in the landscape does not have the same potential for gravity distribution that a higher location has, but it certainly has a higher storage volume. So the types of cultivation practices that happen in this lowest zone that's below the winter frost line would be elements that are not susceptible to late and early frosts. So these may be more like zone two, three activities, like trees, animals, irrigated horticulture. Things like wild rice would be, be good for that area. You have relatively shallow pools, um, not really gonna be affected by frost. It's, it's adapted to um, a temperate climate. Might be a good idea for that. Um, there's other aquatic plants, like I think it's called, it was Arrowhead, I think it's Arrowhead. Um, I'm going to go ahead and look it up. It was uh, a crop that was used a lot more by the native peoples of North America. So this is a, a, an aquatic plant that could be used more. Um, it grows in, in relatively shallow ponds. And I, I believe you, you harvest it when, um, you know, well into the season after the frosts have started. So... Another, another possibility for extending that, that season of activity, spreading your work out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I think it was grown mostly for, I think it's got like a very starchy root. So you just like kind of yank it up out of the mud and it'll just self-propagate. I think this is the same one. Anyway, there's, there's, a, large, there's a long history of, of cultivation for this sort of plant, but there's, there's plenty of other stuff you could do. Um, really more than anything, it takes a little bit of research, finding out what plants go well in your zone. And that's, that's really step one, if you're thinking about growing anything outdoors, is to find out what agricultural zone you're in. And the way they do it in North America is they have the USDA hardiness zones. So I happen to be in zone four, 4B, if you want to get really technical. And basically all that means is in my area, the temperature will almost certainly never dip below negative 25 
I believe it is Fahrenheit. Oh, you know what? Let's pull up a map of um, USDA hardiness zones just to give you an idea because this will determine the, the type of plants that will that are well adapted already to your area. So stuff that you're not going to have to do as much for. So my zone four, uh, negative 20 Fahrenheit through negative 30 Fahrenheit. It almost never gets negative 30. I, I don't think I remember the last time, maybe when I was in like junior high, I think perhaps was the last time we got to be negative 30 Fahrenheit. I don't know the, the Celsius if you, if you need that conversion, but it's, it's pretty cold. <laughs> Just put it that way. Um, you know, there's, there's a large band in the Midwest that is, there's up in zone six, um, less so in zone five. Uh, but th that, that's all going to depend on, on the type of plants that you can use. So that's the first thing you should find out if you want to grow anything outside and not have to do a lot of modifications to keep it alive year after year. Um, there's, there's ways you can extend seasons. You can use things like uh, cold frames, which is basically just a, a miniature greenhouse you put over a raised bed that can keep the soil w warmer longer and can provide some shelter um, throughout the, the winter time. You can, you can put thick layers of, of mulch over things uh, to help them survive the winter. There's different things you can do uh, to extend the season or to, to make it more habitable to things that don't normally grow um, in your zone. But in general, these are, these are a, a good set of guidelines to follow. Because there's a, I mean, you know, just one zone difference and there's a whole different palette of, of plants that you can grow. Like, I can't quite grow this plant called the pawpaw. I'll just, you know, let's go on even a, a further little tangent, if you will. The largest fruiting plant in North America, perhaps also the largest flowering plant, um, is is the pawpaw. It, it. I, you know, I haven't had it, but I've, I've been told it tastes like banana custard. It's not generally used commercially because it has these large seeds that you got to pick out. So it, it makes it harder for mechanical separation, right? Any, basically any, any sort of crop, agricultural crop, if it has large seeds, people either breed it out in the case of like actual bananas or they, they, you know, spend a lot of money mechanically separating it. And then you have a, a much more expensive crop. I think it also doesn't, it doesn't keep very well in, in transit. But anyway, it's this large, like that's, that's about the size of a mango uh, fruit. I really wanted to grow it. Um, Cause it just sounds like a, a really cool thing to, to try out. It sounds really delicious in fact, but it's slightly outside of my zone. So I, you know, unless I were to really set up things in a way where I made sure it had enough heat, even in the, the dead of winter. Um, it's just going to be an uphill battle the whole time. And one of the, the main permaculture principles from Bill Mollison was the idea that we want to work with nature, not against it. So we're not, we don't want to make extra work for ourselves for no good reason. So unfortunately, Papa's a little bit out of my range at this point. Now climate change is pushing those boundaries so it may be that with i mean almost certainly within my lifetime see look oh let's go back to let's go back to that map so i am actually oh boy you know what in this i think in this map it looks like i've moved even into zone five because the metro is right there that the Twin Cities Metro is right there next to the border with Wisconsin. Um, I think that's the, yeah. So it, it very well may be that they've revised the USDA standards, and I am, in fact, now in Zone 5. I knew it was going to come sometime soon. Just within the last 20 years, we've moved from Zone 4A, which is just slightly colder, to Zone for B, so it looks like it, it perhaps, at least according to this particular grower, I don't know if they're, they're using the actual USDA official map, but it, according to them anyway, it looks like I am now in fact in zone five. So I'm not going to call that a benefit of climate change because there's a whole lot of other stuff that's going along with it, such as this massive drought that's happening all across um, 
the United States at the same time, um, and just unending, seemingly heat wave. Um, but it definitely is, it makes things different, different growing conditions that we're going to all have to adapt to. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I had not looked at that recently enough, I guess. Whew. Anyway, that that's enough of that tangent for now. Got a few more comments. Let's see if we got. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Sam again said, I, I never knew that about rain being so inland like that. Yeah, it's amazing. The conveyor belt of water that happens when you just change something simple, like adding trees to a landscape. It really changes it a lot. Oh, you're in the light pink area. Ooh, let's see what that, that's a really high zone. So you must be either in Southern California, perhaps the Bay area or the, the very bottom tip of Texas or southern half of Florida. There's some really cool stuff. Once you get to zone 11, where it's always above 40 degrees and you really have no danger of frost ever, you can grow some really cool tropical stuff. Like there's amazing things that grow in the tropics that I wish I could grow here, but I, I couldn't really without a greenhouse. Yeah, climate change is, oh, you're in the bottom of Florida. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I have, my uh, sister-in-law lives down um, in, oh, what is that? Fort Myers sort of area. So yeah, she's she's just down on the on the edge of that that light pink as well, I believe. There's some amazing stuff you can grow down there. Um, basically, it's tropical. Like at that point, it it, it moves from subtropical to to a tropical zone. Um, but yeah, climate change is definitely scary. I would have to agree with that. Anyway, let's get back to the video because there's a whole lot more we got to get through tonight, and we are already an hour and a half into the stream. And at the very bottom of the valley is where we find some sort of waterway, whether it's just a ditch, a creek, or a river. This waterway is called a riparian zone, and it's best for it to be vegetated with shrubs and trees for perennial wildlife habitat. And the reason that's it's one of the key reasons it's best for that is because it's a very fragile zone. You really don't want to have erosion into your waterways because that can even just having extra soil eroding into it can change how, well, the, the technical term is the turbidity, but for the layperson, it would be how clear the water is, right? If the water becomes less clear just from extra soil eroding into it, that can kill the plant life, that can shade out the plant life that, that may grow at, um, in the shallows of, of that waterway system. It could kill it completely. It could shade out other animals as well, and, and it could uh, starve animals that depend on those plants. You could have huge cascading effects. And with less vegetation holding the, the, the um, banks of the river in place, you're going to have more erosion to the point where uh, things can start cascading on, on itself and to the point where you have huge areas that, that wash away. And um, you have really violent flooding. It's It's... It's a very critical area that has to, again, be treated very delicately because you don't want to have massive erosion. You want to keep as much of that soil there as possible. And also, uh, those, those trees and shrubs can act as a buffer for agricultural runoff. If you have animals, you don't want their waste running out into waterways because that can cause different sorts of problems. Agricultural runoff is, is the main reason for, you may have heard about the, the um, Gulf of Mexico dead zone. And that happens when this runoff creates these huge algae blooms in the ocean. Algae multiplies like crazy and then takes up all the, the uh, um, I, I don't remember if it takes up, no, it doesn't take up the oxygen, but I think as it dies, as it's decomposing, the, the things that are decomposing, I think that's how it works they take up all the oxygen to the point where there's not enough oxygen to support fish and other, and other wildlife. So these small things upstream can have massive devastating impacts the further down you go. So you got to be really careful with it and, and be good, I guess, even stewards of it. Let's not forget about the very top of our system either. At the top of the hill is the best place for a high storage of water. 
water collected and stored at the high point in the landscape profile will have lots of pressure when it's piped down to lower elevations. The idea being to, again, create less work for yourself in the long run. That, that's part of the small and slow solutions. It's that you do small things that have big changes in the long term, but you just start small and slowly things build up. They start self-organizing into ecosystems with, with your guidance as well. Um, and also into these, these, these uh, various water systems as, as well. Um, but then over time, you're making less work for yourself. So if you spend a lot of time and effort building the, these, these sorts of, of um, collection ditches above your house, eventually you're, gonna get it, you're going to get to the point where you don't have to worry about do we have enough water pressure for things, maybe even in your house. You could use it to, to flush toilets. Uh, you could filter it and drink it, you know. Num any number of things you could do with that water. You could use it to, to water animals. You could, you could use that water pressure. Remember he talked about having animals further down on the land. You could use that water pressure to pipe it out to where the animals are, okay? Any number of things that can happen just from putting it in a smart place and letting gravity do the work for you. Now this can be a pond or a water tank and it can be pumped up from the lower ponds using wind or solar energy. Now, another important aspect of this perspective on slope that I'm offering is the solar aspect. In most situations in a humid or temperate environment that has a cold season and dramatic changes in the angle of the sun throughout the seasons, being on the sun-facing slope is optimum. This means south-facing if you're located in the northern hemisphere and north-facing if you're in the southern hemisphere. Now, this is assuming that you're living in a climate where heat and light are at a premium in the fall, winter, and spring. But sometimes there are other needs that are more important, like water, for example. Now, I know of farms in more arid climates that intentionally site themselves on the north slopes, this is in the northern hemisphere, in order to have more assured water supply running off of a north-facing slope where there's less warmth and evaporation from the sun right. and more water flowing down slope and soaking into the water table. So as I said, this is, that's the, this is the beauty of the permaculture design system is that it always adapts to the situation you're in. You wouldn't use this exact design no matter what you face on your land, you would adapt what he's talking about to suit your own needs, to suit your own types of production that you want to do, and to also fit better into the the over you know the overlay of the climate that you find yourself in. So you know it really depends on your site, and I guess I would just say this again and again: each site has a unique set of conditions. So do you want to be on the sun facing or the shadow facing side of the slope? Um, now, in the tropics, orienting towards the sun for solar gain is not even a consideration, where the priority for site orientation may be towards breezes for airflow and cooling. The point is, every site is unique, and the needs are different for each climate zone. So, I've presented to you here some very general concepts and guidelines for designing based on slope, and your individual site will have its own needs and considerations. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. I'd like to welcome a special guest here. This is Jacob Colon. He is a former permaculture student of mine and he uh, got his master's degree now in soil science and hydrology. So we're talking about soils now. We're getting into one of the most important aspects of, of any growing system at all. Even if you're growing in the water, that water then becomes, you know, your soil in many ways. That, that's the thing that the soil is what carries the nutrients. It's where the, the web of life that, that interacts with the plants happens. There's, there's very few plants that have no interactions with things like fungi, um, uh, as well as sometimes beneficial bacteria. Uh, the, the, right, I think it's called rhizobium. Rhizobium or rhizobium, I don't remember exactly. That's the, the, the strain of bacteria that um, it, 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 uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, it, it interacts with the, the different pea family 
vegetables like peas, beans, um, as well as there's a bunch of trees that, that um, are in the same family, like the locusts and stuff. Um, and they uh, form a symbiotic relationship with the root systems where the roots will give them, uh, I think it's like starches or something like that. And in return, they will take nitrogen out of the air and give it to the tree, which is a, a very important component of fertilization or, or the plant as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's almost no plants that have no interaction with their soil that, that just treat it as, you know, um, something to grab onto and hold it in place. That, that almost never happens. There's almost always a huge thriving web of life that's, that's taking place in that soil system, which is why it's so important to keep it intact as much as possible. You'll see a lot of permaculturists advocate for things like no-till systems. The benef there, there are benefits of tilling in the short term. You churn up a bunch of the, the nutrients that are in the lower parts of the soil that may be out of the reach of, of certain root systems. If they're shallow root systems, especially a lot of annuals are shallow rooted systems. And just, just to a, a refresher, annuals are, are most of the fruits and vegetables you see, or the most, most of the vegetables anyway, that you see in the store. Corn, squash, beans, beets, oh, I guess not beets. Um, but they, they put out a bunch of seed every year and then the plant itself dies, doesn't come back the next year. Perennial, you plant it once, it lives year after year, puts out seed little by little in comparison to, to most annuals. So anyway, um, shoot, where was I going with that? Uh, totally lost my train of thought, but I'll, I'll try and, and catch it once again. And so, and he is a self-identified soil nerd. So take it away, Jacob. Thank Thanks. you, Andrew. All right. Let's start this off with a question. Oh, that's right. I was talking about tilling. That's right. So with tilling, you stir up a bunch of those nutrients that may be out of the reach of, of the roots of your plants normally and you make them available again. That's really good in the short term. Um, and at the same time, if you're also like doing something like disking, like you're cutting into the, the soil at an angle, you can chop up the roots of a bunch of weed plants at the same time. So you're just kind of creating a big, fresh, clean slate. And the idea being that you have less weeds to contend with later on, right? At the same time, there's a bunch of drawbacks not only does that expose the soil to the, the air and make it more easily able to be blown away, um, which that, you know, for an extreme example of that, look at the, what happened with the Dust Bowl in the United States during the Great Depression. Farms were literally blowing away. Their, their, their most vital resource, that topsoil, was blowing away in giant dust clouds because of poor management. It was a man-made crisis uh, due to poor agricultural practices. Um, so you're exposing that soil, so that's a bad thing. You're also exposing it to the rain, which can compact it more. That one of the nice services that plants provide as is a shield from the rain. You don't think about the rain as being all that harmful, but over time, just that drip, 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 it's it can compact the soil and um, it can degrade, you know, anything that it, that it falls on over time. Because plants regenerate themselves, they can recover, they can both absorb the impact and then recover from their injuries because they're living things. Okay, with tilling you don't have that as much because you only have living things on the, on the land for the growing season. Um, so there's other downsides to tilling as well. You do stir up a lot of nutrients, but not all of them are going to be there's going to be more than the, the than most plants are going to be able to absorb in any given time. So as soon as irrigation comes through or the rains come through, a lot of those nutrients just get washed away and you, you, you're out those nutrients forever. Especially if you've poorly planned things and you don't have any sort of collection near a waterway. Um, the, the most detrimental thing, though, probably is the destruction of the living soil web of life. Um, that, that thin layer there is where most of the fungi, we're talking thousands of miles of fungi per, per like square yard or whatever, um, 
that that feed the plants that interact with with different um, things like like bugs you know uh, with bacteria there's there's this whole dance of life that's happening just under your feet in the soil and tilling can really destroy that and disrupt that you're destroying the living soil um, so yeah so that's why most permaculturists advocate for no-till systems um, or those are big factors contributing to them not wanting to till what do you see when you look at the yin yang symbol hmm? what do you see i see soil and here's why my eye focuses on the content the ink the material the mass the in the soil case it's uh, mineral and organic matter but it's actually the space that provides the function for soil. And much like a house, when we first look at a house, I start thinking of the material, the, the sheet rock. And so where, he, where I'm assuming he's going with this um, is that soil is not only the material, the, 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 the physical nutrients, the, the, um, the, the material for the roots to grab onto and, and, and hold the plant in place, but also the spaces between. It's, it's space for water to infiltrate. It's space for gas exchange. Most people are not aware, but uh, one of the reasons that, like, say, uh, your house plant, it, it, it suddenly starts looking like it's getting really dry. So you water it more and more and more, thinking, oh, it's just not getting enough water. What's happening? And it's, it's, the tips of its leaves are just drying and drying, and it starts drying all the way back to the stalk, and eventually it dies. It's because the, the, the roots have been flooded for so long that they haven't been able to exchange gases. There, there's, there's gases that are exchanged at the root level that need to happen for a healthy functioning plant. That's why you have to have periods of dry and periods of wet for, for most plants. They're, they're, I mean, they're fully aquatic plants as well, obviously. But for most plants, they need that gas exchange. So there has to be a period of dry and a period of wet. So that space in between the soil particles facilitates that sort of thing when stuff dries out. Rock, the two by fours, the roofing material, but it's actually the space, the doors, the floor plan, the windows that provides the house its function. And much like that, it's the pore space and soils, the dimensions of and total amount of pore space. That so pore space is just the space in between the soil particles. It gives the soil its a function, its, its ability to support life. Another thing that tilling does is you're dragging out a bunch of heavy machinery onto the land, and that heavy machinery also compacts it further, pushing together those, those natural pore spaces, making it a less functional soil, basically. So, and, and then the tilling can try and reverse that, but then it's just the never-ending cycle of, 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 you know, loosening things and then at the same time compacting them um so yeah why not just cut out that entire system entirely especially if we can manage things in a way where we never have more uh work to do than than our group can handle at any given time more specifically its ability to hold and release water its ability to hold and release nutrients its ability to conduct water from a precipitation event down to the water table Oops. so let's dwell on this stuff and space concept a little longer with the nether what's the difference between a foundation for a building and the foundation any guesses foundation for a building foundation for life foundation for life let me illustrate that for you and the answer is space life happens in spaces the conversion from solid rock into smaller minerals with space between them is a term called weathering and it is the sum of all biological physical and chemical processes that's what gets you the the there's oh, is it, i can remember if it's three or four different i think it's four four different types four different types of of, of soil basically um, and three of them are just completely non-biological so you have Sandy soil that has the most pores in between it. You know, you, if you ever poured water onto a bunch of sand, you can see it soaks through very quickly. You have then um, the in-between 
which is silt. Um, you see silt build up in, in like rivers and stuff a lot. That's, that's kind of in between sand. And then, and then the third one, which is clay. Clay is, is, is um, the finest particles. There's the least amount of space in between. It's really good at holding water. So each of these things can have a function on your land. Clay can be good for lining ponds. It can be a good way to, if you don't want water to, to pass through. Sand can be good uh, if you do want more water to pass through. And then there's the, the biological, um, I believe usually the technical term is, is, is hummus or humus, um, and that's just decomposed plant material. So that's the, the, the fourth component of soil, the fourth type of soil, I guess. These they can either break apart rocks or dissolve and reform into secondary minerals. And in the soil science perspective, the beach sand, 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 the stuff you pick up at the beach is looks like, looks like he's going to go through the same thing. So <laughs> it's huge, it's big. And to be able to get some perspective on that, let me draw you a window. So sand is huge, and weathering will drive large particles such as sand into smaller particles such as silt and clay and this is one millimeter so sand's got a diameter of a range of two millimeters to 0 0.05 millimeters silt the medium sized particles are going to be from 0 0.05 millimeters to 0 0.002 millimeters so you might as well just get out there with your, your little uh tape measure or, or ruler or whatever and then you can de determine what you have <laughs> that's that's uh that's not true at all you, you're almost never gonna have to classify it that um, precisely. A good test for for what you have is if you take a little bit of it, um, especially if it's rained recently, you take a, a hunk of your soil and you press it together in your fist. If you release it and it all crumbles away right away, you have mostly sandy soil. If it, um, it, if it mostly retains its shape, but there's still some sponginess to it, you probably have some silt, maybe some, some organic matter as well. And then if you press it together and it forms, uh, it, it takes the, the shape that you form it into, it's clay. Uh, and that's, that's an easy way to, to figure out what you got. There's anything less than 0 0.002 millimeters is going to be a clay sized particle. Weathering is a function of five things. Climate, organisms, relief, parent material, and time. Arguably, climate is the most important factor when considering weathering. To further illustrate my point, let's look at a map of... So sun is going to perform weathering, wind is going to perform weathering, freezing thawing, and just the movement to water is going to perform weathering. Um, and these are all factors of climate. Uh, you know, how much precipitation, how severe it is when it happens, how much wind is coming, what direction it's coming from, if you're sheltered from the wind, all these sorts of things of the distribution of climate zones across the world. If we took this map and we faded it... <laughs> don't know why he made it seem as though he just drew that map with his pen. He just made the corners. ...into a map of the distribution of soil orders across the world. We would see the striking similarity of distributions. That happens because where there is wet and hot conditions, there's an associated soil order that forms due to it. When it is dry, the weathering rate is inhibited and there's a certain soil that forms there. And where it's cold, you run into gelisols, really, really frozen soils. And there's many different climate zones across the world, but let's focus on the three that are explored in this class. Dry lands, temperate, and tropical climates. And I'm gonna draw for you a zoomed in window into what those soils look like. So it might not be everyone's, you know, cup of tea, um, but but it is important just to know uh, some of the basics about it. It's going to help you determine again what sort of things you can grow on your land. You can always change the soils to a certain degree. You can add clay. You can add sand. Uh, you can you can pick plants that that are going to add more organic material over time. But more or less, you're going to pretty much have to deal with what you got. Uh, same is true with things like pH. I don't know if we're even going to get into pH in this series, but it's a lot easier to just go with what you have and then try to adapt your plan to the conditions you find on the ground rather than trying to change everything.
because it's probably it, it, it might work for a little bit. It's probably not going to work forever. There's probably a reason that you have the, the soils that you do. Um, and the best we can do is pick plants that are suited for it and animals that are suited for it and, and help to build things. So in a dryland environment where the temperatures are cool and the precipitation is low, our weathering rate is low. And we can see that our particle sizes are large, primarily consisting of sand, a little bit of silt, and a little bit of clay. These large sand particles produce large pores. These large pores drain under the force of gravity, so this soil can conduct water well. It cannot hold water up against the force of gravity, so the soil's ability to hold and release water is limited. It's got a slight amount of clay, and that means that there, the soil's ability to hold and release nutrients is low. Comparing that to a temperate soil, where we have moderate weathering rate due to moderate temperatures and moderate precipitation patterns, we have a nice balance between sand, silt, and clay. I call this texture class a loam. It's got some large particles and therefore it's got some large pores. And those pores can uh, give the soil's ability to conduct water to a satisfactory nature. We have some medium-sized particles and they have medium-sized pores. Those medium-sized pores can hold water up against the force of gravity and in a pressure range that plants can access. So the soil's ability to hold and release water is favorable in a temperate climate. It's also got a moderate amount of clay. And it's important to note that this, these are impure clays. And these impure clays have a slight charge to them. And that's what gives this soil's ability to hold and release nutrients, which is satisfactory. If we go to a tropical environment where the weathering rate has driven all of our particle sizes to clay and a little bit of silt, I would just call this clay. Um, these are fine particles, therefore they have fine pores. These fine pores do not drain under the force of gravity, therefore the soil's ability to conduct water is low. The soil's ability to hold water is high, but able to release water at a pressure range that plants can access is not there. So the soil's ability to hold and release water is limited. As well, these clays, due to weathering, the clays have dissolved and reformed one too many times and they've become pure. So their charge that this soil has because of these clays is limited. So the soil's ability to hold and release nutrients is limited in a tropical environment. At this juncture, it's important to note organic matter. Okay. Organic matter is not technically a soil. We're just, we're, you know, when we talk about soils, it's just the, the inert medium that we're, we're growing in. But, but organic matter does change how these soils function. Um, it, it tends to move it towards the, the middle, towards the, the medium in terms of all the things he's talking about. The ability to hold and retain water, um, porosity, these sorts of things. It, it, uh, it, organic matter tends to be the great mitigator in all of this. So what happens to you when you die? Oh. That's what I want to know. When you die of laid on soil, a certain amount of me would be easily, readily decomposed and nutrients would become available. But there's a certain part of me that would remain stable and be provide a charge to the soil, giving the soil's ability to hold and release nutrients. In dry lands environments, uh, organic matter accumulation is low because there's no water available. In, in tropical environments, the decom... In, in, in dry lands, things tend to dry out and desiccate. Uh, so they, they, they lose all of their water and just turn into you know, crumbly dry stuff that blows away in the wind. So there's, there's not as much retention. There's ways to get to mitigate that. Usually it's going to involve things like altering the texture of the soil, coming back to like the, the ditch and, and berm model so that, that the winds don't just blow everything away completely. And also um, choosing plants that are going to add some shade to help retain moisture. These sorts of things can, can help fight against that. Composition rate of organic matter is high, so organic matter does not accumulate. And in temperate environments, organic matter accumulates. Okay, and there's that's a lot of information, but it's important for me to introduce one more topic to allow for you to objectively evaluate our proposed strategies, and that is the topic of landscape position. So, in our landscape, if we went to a stream 
in a three-dimensional landscape. We went to a stream and we went to, up into the hillside nearby. And we cut into that hillside and looked at the cross section. We'd see something like this, where we have a soil surface, this is our ground surface. We have a bedrock surface where the, the depth transfers from something like this that has space to something that does not. And then we have this water table. And if I did agriculture in this position, uh, what would my depth be until I ran into a root limitation? In this case, the depth is shallow before I run into a water table. And I know what you're thinking, water's good, but water also prevents oxygen from getting into my root zone. Yeah, again, this, this gas exchange that happens in the root zone. And if you do not have plants that have the ability to get oxygen into the root zone, this is a limitation. Up here at the, at the summit... We in fact, uh, um, if you're familiar with mangroves, um, the, the mangrove is, is one of the few uh, fully aquatic trees like you can grow in complete water and the, the, the soil that it tends to find itself in is so oxygen poor that it has to send up these these snorkel roots basically so that it can have gas exchange up above the, the water level so gas exchange very important for for all plants um, all terrestrial plants, I should say. I mean, it is important for aquatic plants as well, but they, they do things a little bit differently to get their oxygen. We noticed that we have a depth until we hit bedrock, and we're, we're running out of space. So we have this much height before we run into something that looks like this to something that looks like that, okay? We've done, we've covered three climate zones, dryland, temperate, and tropical, and each have their own issues and a set of strategies to go with them. And the strategies are numerous. We could talk about cover crops, key line design, we could talk about hugo culture, we can talk about compost. Uh, hugo culture, an interesting one. Um, hugo culture, very very briefly, is, is a system where you make a berm, you know, that mound of soil, but instead of having to have the entire thing soil, you take a bunch of logs and you make that the core of it. Um, and there are benefits and drawbacks to this, but one of the main benefits is you need less material to make the hill overall. You need less soil, right? Um, another benefit is that as that log breaks down, it will, it will be a whole big pocket of organic material that's down in the soil. And, and stuff that, that sends its roots down, down into it will find a lot of good water retention. It acts like a, a, a sponge with all that organic material. Some drawbacks are that because you're putting so much carbon into the soil at once, it really, it will take all the available nitrogen that it can find in the, the, the higher levels of soil and, and use it for decomposition. So as it's breaking down, it's best to put in nitrogen fixing plants that, that can add that, that nitrogen that it's going to be seeking out in decomposition. Most compost needs, it needs a, a balance of, of, dry or carbon rich stuff and wet or nitrogen rich stuff they come together to get all the biological life going that that decomposes things um and we can if we get the ratio right we can do things very quickly to the point where it starts heating up we'll get into that later on the idea of doing a hot compost um, but just for now it's it's just know that there's there's benefits and there's drawbacks too systems like Hugo culture, but it's, a, it's an important concept that a lot of permacult permaculturists like to employ, so I just want to give you an idea of, of what that was. Purchase property just where major elevation turns to flat land, right? Well, I mean, it, it, it depends, and that's a, 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 a big cliche in permaculture, <laughs> to the point where it's kind of annoying that, that you ask them a question, they'll say it depends, but it, but the frustrating thing is it's usually true. It depends on what you want to grow. It depends on what your local climate is. Uh, it depends on the local topography. You know, you may be on the prairie and, and there may be uh, not much change in elevation at all. It may be basically about as flat as, as, as earth can get. Um, so it really depends on what you want to do. Not necessarily the, the, the best to be... Um, right where it turns into flatland. Although, as we've discussed earlier, 
valleys tend to be more fertile than than um, the top of a, a ridge line, right? Just because nutrients tend to flow downhill. But that does, that's not to say there's nothing you can do about it. There's definitely ways to mitigate that as well, like with that ditch and berm on contour system that we had talked about earlier. You can get it so you can slow down that nutrient transfer down the hill because you're catching the, the stuff as it runs off, right? Water is having to filter through the ground rather than carrying the nutrients with it as it runs over the surface. So it, it really depends on what you want to do. Um, and, you know, it depends on so many other factors. It could be, it could be that that land has just been polluted by uh, previous agriculture. Uh, maybe you had, maybe there was, you know, if, if there was like a pig farm on it before, like one of those high density operations, I probably wouldn't get that no matter what the elevation was, just because it would be so abused and, and mismanaged um, of ground. And it would take a lot of, of mitigation to do whatever it is you want to do. Um, it, it really depends, but, but definitely you're on average going to have more nutrients in a, in a valley. Like um, I talk about the inflection point in, in the ground. So where it goes from sloping downwards more and more to less and less and less, that tends to be the point where you start to get more nutrients building up and more soils building up just naturally. So it might be a good place for you to locate your house. Might be. Boasting. But I'm going to take a zoomed out look. And in the, in the dry land agriculture, my proposed strategy is to place agriculture in a low point in the landscape where we have an ample amount of catchment area that can capture water and draw it either to or near your site. Okay. In a temperate system, from a soils perspective, just on this model alone, our soil functions are favorable. And actually, annual agriculture could be a sustainable system in a temperate climate. Keep in mind, there are gonna be site-specific concerns due to our soils, and this is life science. There are more exceptions than there are rules. In a tropical system, uh, our soil's ability to hold and release nutrients is low. Uh, the nutrient cycling is occurring e above the soil or either just on the top. And if we go out there and cut and burn our organic material, the nutrients that are cycling, we'd see a response for a year, maybe, maybe two. But your soil's ability to be able to regenerate that vegetation is extremely limited. So my proposed strategy is to design a perennial agricultural system in a tropical climate so that the plants have a longer time period to interact with the soil and access the soil resources. Also with those perennials, one of the nice and really cool things about perennials that, that is more so than, than annuals is they tend to send down deeper and more roots over time. And then as, as the plant matures, every year, uh, one branch or, or a few branches of the roots is going to get pruned off just, just through natural processes. It, it, the plant decides, not that it has a brain to decide, but through whatever process, the, pl the plant decides to stop supporting a certain root. And that root just dies and decomposes. And now you have a shaft of... Uh, plant material that's been plunged and is now starting to decompose down in that soil. And over time, you can really build up that, that, that amount of organic matter. And remember, organic matter is, is more than anything going to mitigate your soil circumstances. If it's too sandy, it will bring it more towards water retention. If it's too clay, it will free up more space and open more pores for water to infiltrate. It brings things towards the center, having more organic matter. And perennials, more than any other plant, or more than annuals, are, are really good at, at building long-term soil and long-term organic matter into the soil. Right? If you're enjoying this content, I archive all of my streams. I edit them down as well, so it's not quite as long. Um, but I, I put all my streams up on my YouTube channel. You just search for bread theory with no underscore there. 
um, and you'll notice that that symbol that symbol is is my symbol for my philosophy that I'm trying to build here combining leftism permaculture and new urbanism into something I call Solaris which is it 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 uh, is a Latin word for of the Sun and it's a it's a metaphor for the interconnectedness of, of not only all of these theories but what's at the core of each of these theories leftism permaculture new urbanism are all about building communities of various type and building the interconnected relationships between all living things so hence the metaphor so I, I, I was searching recently there apparently is at least one more person who goes by bread theory on YouTube um, so look for look for that symbol there the the, the uh, simple fractal triangle uh, that's supposed to represent um, the the whole being more than the sum of its parts so you have the the large triangle being made up of nine smaller triangles if you add them all together if you take every sort of triangle that you can make within there it comes up to 13 different triangles you can make with that simple fractal um, and then behind that is supposed to be the sunshine shining through and then there's green for the connection of of life to all of us to living things um, that we're all connected to the, the green growing things of the world. Um, and then the triangle symbol itself representing the three branches of, of thought that I'm trying to meld into one, as, as well as, as um, building solidarity with various um, oppressed people throughout history. Downward facing tri triangle has been symbol of, of oppressed people for, for quite some time. So it's just a way to, to, to kind of signal that sol solidarity with various struggles as we all um, work with one another to, to pull ourselves up out of this system of, of capitalism that is uh, destroying ourselves and the planet. Anyway, enough explanation. If you just go find uh, Bread Theory on YouTube and that symbol, uh, I have all my videos up here as well as a number of playlists. I have the playlist for um, the, the couple of books that I've gone through now for The Conquest of Bread and The Communist Manifesto, starting out the principles of communism next week. Um, and then if you want to see all these permaculture videos, the, the link, are, um, it is in uh, the playlist entitled LSB TV on permaculture, because I used it for a previous... Uh, Facebook stream for, for a group that I run there, Alice B TV. So I'm going to go ahead and put that link in chat right now. We're just going to go ahead and finish up this video and then we're going to, we're going to call it a night and I'll read you into someone cool. So now is the time to, if you have any suggestions of, of who you'd like me to read into, uh, go ahead and let me know. Uh, cause we'll be finishing up. We've got two minutes, just about two minutes left in, in this video. And then um, any questions you have left over, I'll try and cover those right now too. Throw those out for sure. Oh, thank you very much for following me there, um, Sam. Oh, I'm, I'm so happy you, you are, you're enjoying the stream so far. And if any of you have, have not followed this channel yet either, please go ahead and do so. I would appreciate you coming back and chatting with me again. And, and, and next week, in fact, we're going to take a break from the permaculture on our Sunday stream, and we're going to go... Uh, Dan Platt of the Three Lefts podcast, a really great podcast you guys should check out. Uh, I think if you just go to threelefts.com, I think. Uh, but anyway, search for the Three Lefts podcast and whatever player you have. Check that out. He's going to be joining me on stream next Sunday, and we're going to do some more stuff on new urbanism. We did some fun memes last time and, and learned about this really bizarre concept of pencil towers it's this this strange product of, of legal fictions in new york city where you have these skyscrapers thousand feet tall like literally a thousand feet tall and they're only wide enough for like one condominium so it's the, they call them pencil sky, skyscrapers and it's really bizarre how those things came about that was fun learning about and going through and we're gonna do the same sort of thing next sunday probably around the same time probably around 7 p.m central standard time but we'll see i'll let you know but yeah, let's let's finish this up right now. And um, yeah, any more questions you have, get them out now. And anyone you'd like me to raid into, please also put out that suggestion as well. There's one more concept I'd like to cover, and that is the concept of nutrient mining versus nutrient cycling. Does your system look like this? 
This is my nutrient pool. Carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. It is extracted out of the soil due to our extraction mechanism, a plant. And we use that biomass to support a human, right? And we take the end of that product into waste, into the landfill. And I mean, I mean, I'm seriously talking about food waste. What do you do with your food waste? What do you do with your waste? Poo. <laughs> does it make it back into this pool or does it end up in a landfill? This is one, one of the permaculture principles, produce no waste. So instead of looking at something as a waste product, virtually anything, especially in, in, in um, if we're talking about biological processes, the waste product of one thing is, is always going to be the food for something else. So it's just a matter of connecting up the right flows and then you have much less waste to, to deal with overall. This is a linear system and it's limited the number of humans that we can support. Uh, so you're asking Yolo Bung and stuff. I like that name. Uh, are you familiar with KNF? That particular acronym is not ringing any bell. So if you could help me out a little bit, uh, just let me know and I'll, and I'll tell you what I know about it. Or it's limited by how quickly we deplete this resource. Okay, we can look at our soil minerals and nutrients. Oh, Korean natural farming. Someone had brought that up in a previous stream. I meant to look into that. Um, I don't know anything about it in particular. It sounds pretty cool from from what little I've heard. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and find some videos on it that I that I can add to this this um, this playlist of stuff so we can we can maybe maybe we'll do that next stream as well or next time we come back to permaculture. So a couple weeks from now. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely gonna look into it. So thanks, thanks for the suggestion. It's like this, or we could take a different model. Yeah. And just by the way, because um, I'm such a small streamer at this point, I don't have anyone helping me out. I don't allow links in the chat, but you can always whisper them to me. And if I, if I check them out and find that they're, they're you know, good to go, I'll, I'll put them out on the stream. But just uh, at this point, just flat don't allow links in chat not doing anything wrong don't worry about it it's just um just my policy for now so just so you know or do we look at it as a cycle we have a nutrient pool of our soil resources that can be uptaken by a microbe the microbe can be eaten by another microbe and there's going to be a lot of nutrient cycling in this feedback loop right here there's a bit of excess nutrients that are in the soil water that just happen to be available and uptaken into a plant caught the, the last stream that I did about permaculture, you might remember how we, we talked about aquaponics. I think we talked about it on, on actually a couple of them so far. Aquaponics tries to, to mimic this sort of a cycle. So you have uh, aquaculture, which is, is growing fish, and you have hydroponics, which is growing plants, food crops in a, in a uh, aqueous solution, and you combine them together. So the fish produce waste, it's broken down by a bacteria that gets then cycled through these grow beds. Uh, the, the plants reach the roots down into the water and pull up the nutrients that the bacteria have broken down and they clean the water and they have a, a, a essentially free source of fertilizer rather than having to buy uh, chemical fertilizers. So these two systems support each other and it's, it's, it's the same sort of, of cycling of nutrients that he's talking about right now. Plant. The plant dies, decomposes, and returns back to the nutrient pool, where we, the humans, are simply a little side diversion. Thank you. I like the way he did that. That that's really that lays it out very well. So instead of you know it going to people and then our waste going to some place where it's just stored, we're putting it back into the system that that fed us in the first place. You know. It's, 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 this is literally the cycle of life that he's talking about. And these are the sorts of systems that we want to create through permaculture. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. So we're going to leave permaculture design for water until next time. Um, I thank you all very much for joining me tonight. Um, please, if you haven't already, give me a, give me a follow. Um, please check out my, my YouTube channel again. Um, and I'm going to put one more link out there. Uh, let's see, where is that? My link tree. 
If you want to follow me in any of the social medias, any of the things that I do, this is the best place to do it. You go to linktr dot ee slash bread underscore theory, and uh, it'll it'll give you links to all the the different places that you can find me. Um, so I always always appreciate new followers, new new people coming into the stream and and chatting and asking good questions, and uh, you know making this more than than just me uh, being a teacher to who you know maybe sometimes no one it's been. Building little by little, using those small and slow solutions to to slowly build my channel up here. And I appreciate you all for, for being an integral part of that growth and, and that building. Uh, it means a whole lot to me. Uh, my goal here is to, to at least make it to affiliate where I can start getting um, subscribers and, and, and start getting maybe a little bit of a, a side income in here. Um, so yeah, so... Tonight we did permaculture, next Sunday at, at the same time, around the same time frame, about 7 to 9 p.m. We'll be doing uh, New Urbanist Stuff with Dan Platt of the Three Lefts Podcast. And then this upcoming Friday, assuming I don't, you know, this, this last Friday my work got in the way, so assuming it doesn't get in the, in the way this Friday, we'll be starting in with the principles of communism. And that's, that's how I started this channel, just doing um, theory audiobooks, which I'll play um, usually one chapter per stream, and then stop in a comment and answer questions and, and all that sort of thing, and, and just get, get a discussion and a, and a dialogue going with you guys. So if you're interested in theory, um, if you've perhaps read the Communist Manifesto, but found it a little bit lacking in, in terms of substance, Principles of Communism is, is kind of the filler that, that most people expect when they, they come to things like the, the Communist Manifesto. So it'll really lay out one man's idea for a communist society. Um, that being Frederick Ingalls, one of the, one of the co-authors of the Communist Manifesto that, that <laughs> for some reason just kind of gets left out in, in the history books. It's always down to Marxism, but it's really marx Engelsism, you know. Um, although Marx did a great body of work on his own, and so did Engels. Um, but anyway going to start into that book this upcoming Friday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, so please tune in for that. And, and of course, the, the best way to get notified is, is to become a follower. Um, and also, uh, if you have friends that are getting into theory and, and want some good, you know, we're, we're, we're still doing the, the intro level stuff, the entry level stuff, so if they want a good entry point into that, maybe if you could point them my way, um, come hang out in the... the the stream as well. That would be awesome. I'd be very much indebted to you. Uh, okay. So you say, I f uh, Sam, you say, I first even considered any of this uh, from uh, a, a TED Talk that I saw about a year ago. Oh, that's cool. And Yellow Bong Stuff says, God's work. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, about Desert... desert about desertification in Africa and how the herds were preserving it. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, so perhaps you've come across uh, Alan Savory's work. Um, he's been a big advocate of a particular type of, of grazing. To mixed results, he's, he's not quite at the permaculture level. Um, but there definitely is, there definitely are ways that you can introduce animals that, that help regenerate the land. Um, sometimes it's a keystone species. There's a really good video out there by George Monbiot. Uh, and it's about the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone Park and how that actually helped the streams come back uh, to better functionality. It, it helped the, the trees start to grow again. And it's all because they were this keystone species of, of predator and they would help drive the herds into tight, compact organizational forms and they would always have to be on the move because they were they were getting this this predator pressure. And what that did was that that allowed breathing space for a lot of these seedlings to to actually get going, where otherwise they would have just been, you know, when the when the herds didn't have these herds of bison and and deer and elk and stuff, when they didn't have any predator pressure, they would just eat all the young seedlings they could because it was it was more tender than the the woodier adult versions of the plants. And so they, 
the trees were, you know, the, the, the forests were kind of dying along these waterways, these little clumps of, of trees. When the, when the wolves came in, they, they reversed that process. So it often can be about adding animals back to the, the land. Animals are an integral part of any ecosystem. You can't have an ecosystem without animals. Um, and people can't be the only animals affecting the land. It has to be uh, a lot. A lot of different species working together to, to help shape and put into balance a, a dynamic equilibrium of, of an ecosystem, right? But that's cool that you've, you've started studying this stuff. It's, it's really important. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, so that does sound a lot like Alan Savory. They were killing the elephants, thinking that it was good. Yeah, he, he had made, like, part of his life's work getting rid of these elephants, thinking that it was a good thing for the, the habitats because they would go crashing through the brush, and downing trees, all the stuff he just saw as very destructive. Turns out it was the opposite. They were clearing paths where then there would be more species diversity that would come in after it uh, because there was a cleared section of, of forest. So they were creating more species diversity, which supported a wider variety of animals and, and just helped things flourish more and more. So it, it turns out... Uh, Elephants were actually helping the landscape, not making it worse, just as you say. Uh, Marx has a nice ring, has a, a ring to it. Yeah, Marx does have a, a it's a, a better mouthfeel than angles. It's kind of a, uh, not as pleasant to, to say. So maybe that's the reason. I think I'm going to do EPA regulations. Hold on, let me just mute, make sure it's muted. Whoop, there we go. Looks like he's just playing Bioshock right now, but uh, he does cool... Uh, leftist content as well. That will be the raid for tonight. Please uh, give EPA regulations a follow once you get there. So here you go with EPA regulations, and I will see you hopefully this this Friday for uh, the Principles of Communism, the first chapter. And until that time, uh, lectem, friends.